much for coming this afternoon or this evening. Uh, I am so pleased to see uh, old friends, new faces, students, people in the community, and I would like to say thank you and welcome everybody to uh, tonight's uh, event. Uh, I just would like to give you a little bit of an idea of what's going on here. I am not the uh, director of the University Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, I'm Eva Fierst. I'm the curator of education. Lorita Yarlo is on a research trip to Europe, uh, particularly at the Documenta, number 13, that she's enjoying right now. Uh, and so I am kind of sitting in for the moment. Um, we are opening our new academic year with the dialogue of the, with the collection, and that's why you're all here, but I also would like to tell you a little bit about what's going on uh, before and during this particular exhibition. Uh, in August, we had an opening uh, of works from, uh, by Carolyn Webb. Those are works that you probably read in the newspaper because on Thursday and today, there was something about this in the Hampshire Gazette. Uh, Carolyn Webb was picked from a uh, selection of proposals by a jury. And the large, really large canvases are hanging on the Fine Arts Center wall facing the Hague Mall, that huge U-shaped uh, uh, horseshoe uh, drive around where the buses go. It's a major hub at UMass. Uh, those 24 by 12 canvases are done by Carolyn Webb, and uh, they are uh, up on view until November, and they're also part of the Amherst Biennial. Uh, coming soon, in about a month from now, is uh, the works, a sound installation by a well-known French artist whose name is Céleste bourdier mongenon and uh, that is going to happen in our main gallery. Uh, that sound installation is, uh, is focusing on language, the language of computers and the language of music. And uh, Celeste is taking information over the internet of international stock market and changing that into music. So you will have this piano making music according to the economic situation in the world. <laughs> there are some other situations as well happening. <clears throat> and this is going to be a very uh, different uh, uh, approach to contemporary art than what we're doing right now. Uh, this is Dialogue of a Collection. It's a series. Uh, it's the fifth, I think. Is it the fifth? Yes. Is it the fifth? Mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of an invitation that we are uh, reaching out to local artists who then go into our permanent collection. They are going through these images via our database that is online. Everybody can do that, by the way. Just go on our, our website, search a little bit, and you find the entry to the heavenly gate of the permanent collection. <laughs> Over 2,600 pieces, uh, mostly on paper, uh, uh, drawings, prints, and photography. And uh, Betsy uh, was doing this this summer and uh, looked at these works. And uh, what we're always doing with the dialogue is uh, the artists are going to look at it through their own personal point of view and looking at this, at this uh, collection not as a curator with a certain theme, but it's much more on a gut level. And then they're picking works that harmonize <laughs> or contrast on with their own works. And the own, the own works are then uh, hung in conjunction with these works from the permanent collection. We like this very much because it gives an opportunity to pieces in the collection to be shown outside the regular context. It, it completely refreshes and energizes our permanent collection. So we are always very fond of that. Uh, the counterbalance to this, and it actually bookends our academic year towards the end of the year, we are going to have, again, an, um, a, a permanent collection at work, so to speak, uh, with curatorial interns, it has art history graduate students who are looking at the permanent collection, and they are curating from the collection an exhibition that has an, uh, a theme and uh, an, an intellectual uh, background to it, and they are going to have the opportunity to study 
uh, what it takes to put up an, an exhibition from fundraising, which is a big deal. We can't do anything without fundraising because we don't have the budget for it. To uh, conceptualizing something and, uh, and then making it happen, hanging a show, putting the labels on, uh, writing the press releases, giving talk. So that's what we are going to do in the, f in the spring at the end of the semester, what the students are going to be working on all year long. So that's how we are going to use, utilize our primary collection. But now I would like to introduce you, somebody you all know already, Betsy Stone. <laughs> So this is the conversation that we are having, and it is almost like a conversation uh, that we would have sitting on the couch drinking a glass of wine. Yes. This time it's going to be water, but uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a very informal conversation. So We're Betsy, old friends. Yes. So Betsy, you are a, a, uh, an artist who is mostly painting in a representational style. Definitely. What am I doing in this contemporary museum of, <laughs> of I, I, art? That was my question to you. So please. <laughs> well, it's been a wonderful opportunity, actually, for me to, to look at these images, almost 3,000 images online, and to winnow them down to 300 that I was interested in. And I couldn't help but look through my figurative art lens. And um, I appreciate all kinds of art. I've, studied and looked at and traveled to see all kinds of art. So it was really fascinating to see what, what has been collected here since the 60s. And um, um, I found that my work can fit in, you know? It doesn't have to relate exactly this, that, you know, an exact relationship, but it's some of, sometimes it's a little more abstract, the, the connection. And I hope that you've, you know, been able to enjoy the sort of transition through a woman's life uh, from young to old to transcending to disembodied um, images. Um, it, was a, it was really expansive experience for me to see my work in the context of all these different works that I was attracted to. And um, uh, it, I think is, is um, taking me in some new directions just because I've been exposed to this kind of work. So it's been very um, enriching for me. You picked some very interesting pieces and not necessarily uh, uh, because they were from, you know, artists with a big name, of which we have a few here as well. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but you, you picked some works that uh, aside from a couple of uh, ex, uh, exception, you picked them all and they had all certain things in common. Yes. And they had something. Uh, and it was not necessarily obvious right away. Right. Right. It wasn't just, I mean, you know, the overall thing was figurative. But there's something about these works and I haven't been able to put my, my finger on it exactly, but something that that uh, evoked a visceral reaction for me. If the, if, if the work evoked a visceral reaction, if it felt like there was more going on than just the line or the color or the image, you know, it felt like there was um, an undefinable quality of, of uh, I don't know what, life, umami. I just learned the word umami. Okay. It Betsy, means why the, don't fifth, you? Yeah. the fifth sense. Some Japanese man in the 1800s um, defined a fifth taste sense besides sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. And he called it umami. And so I think I was looking for the umami in the visual here. It was actually, uh, she was considering making this the title of the show, but she was thinking it might get a little too obscure. Uh, so we got embodied, disembodied, which also I think uh, uh, works really well for this exhibition. It does. So, it does. Uh, Betsy has developed umami in the course of this uh, last few months. Mm. Um, and I liked how you um, almost made a storyline out of that. Uh, a, a bunch of, uh, of images that, that seemed to be completely incoherent in some ways. It was a, uh, it was a reaction, it was almost a visceral reaction. But then you came up with uh, with some kind of a sequential way of, uh, of working 
the exhibition out for yourself. Mm. With a little help from you, Ava. <laughs> really. You did. Really. I learned a lot from this. This was like a master's in art program. I never went to art school, so this was art school for me, or part of art school. Um, to see, um, to put things in small groupings and see how they relate in a small group and another small group, and then, and then something evolves from that. You almost have to you know, trust your, your innards on this. And I think that was very successful. I think, Betsy, you did a great job trusting your innards. And, uh, and you see now on this, uh, uh, in this exhibition, uh, in case you haven't noticed this yet, but I'm sure many of you have noticed the underlying themes within uh, and the, the uh, space to my, in my, to my back, it has all to do with the disembodiment or the absence of the body to a large degree. Uh, whereas the opposite end of the exhibition shows also some form of an absence, it's the dissolution of the body. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those are some two nice little counterparts to this. Um, I particularly, you know, should, I, I don't know if I should say what my favorite. Say, 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 say. Um, a particular vignette I like very much, which is on this wall in the, this little alcove there, with a photographer, a photography by an old woman, and then a sketch of yours of mm -hmm. a naked old woman, mm -hmm. and then a face of an old woman. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is a really poignant but very rich um, triptych, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the people who are uh, interested in the, um, the, the middle painting is a drawing by Betsy, and the right image is a drawing by Anna Schuleit of uh, Louise Bourgeois. And you don't know that, and I'm just telling you that. So it's, a, it's, a, it's this beautiful um, threesome that captures a lot of, uh, of interesting uh, ideas. Mm. And then hopefully moves into a more transcendent spiritual feeling as you go around the room. And um, so I wanted to incorporate not only the bodily, the very you know, physical experience we all have, but also transcend that, you know, the spiritual or what happens after our bodies are gone. So Betsy <clears throat> is taking something very real, a very uh, concrete image of three gourds, squashes, whatever it's oh, called, right. like white yeah squashes in a very rich kind of a tonal composition. And she calls it heavenly bodies and just supposes it with uh, something much more abstract, um, conceptual, in, uh, and then at one point it's fairly figurative and it comes back to a, a, a unit of, uh, of a concept which is, uh, you know, death dying. It's basically a memento mori. The heavenly bodies are, is just a touch, touchstone. And then you have this amorphous abstract image. Then you have an image by Kiki Smith, uh, a, a well-known artist that is practicing. She works a lot with bodies. Mm. And the body is, is, is a reference to her. And I think that's a, that's a very um, nice kind of a connection there. But what you see is a printout of a figure and there's a candle in front of it. The candle is real and it's almost a religious image of, of uh, and the candle is um, an Austrian candle for Catholic Church and it says take my body, take this and uh, this is my body. So mm -hmm. it's part of the um, Catholic religious services of the impersonation of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So this image is there and then there's an image of an easel and a chair. The easel has nothing on it, the chair has nobody in it. Uh, you see it almost as maybe the artist's point of view, but there's an absence of it. So there's a sense of loss. This entire corner is such a memento mori. Mm -hmm. But we didn't mean to get so dark. No, 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 no. <laughs> Actually, That's when I look at that easel piece, I see the artist there. I feel the artist there. I don't have a visual sense, but I feel that there's an artist there. So of course. there's a presence there. Yes, the yeah. artist did it. Yeah, and yeah. It's like the, yeah so it's, it's, a, it's a nice kind of a, a tension in the book. Right. Some other things I was thinking about when I was looking at the images is I was looking for uh, works by women. And uh, I tried to incorporate as many as I could, but not as many as I would have liked to. 
because the uh, collection, which began in the 60s, doesn't have as many um, as, as I would like to have seen. I was also looking for works by regional artists or people who are associated with the um, university. Uh, first, I was just looking, I was seeing with my eyes and picking what I liked. And then I would you know, find out a little bit about the artist and say, oh, oh this person taught here. This person taught here. Still so, teaches. Susan Yehoda, so, um, you know, or, you know, or uh, taught here once before, Lionel Gongora. Um, interesting connections. Uh, Sante Graziano in that room is a, is a man who painted some local murals. So it was interesting to me to find local connections as well as some, you know, this is Philip Perlstein, a very famous figurative artist. But this is an unusual Philip Perlstein because instead of nudes, he's painting I think this must be a niece or a daughter or something. He's drawing or making a print. So I, I, it's interesting when you get into who the artists are and what their connection is to the university. And then there, of course, is the donor connection. And I don't even, you know, you know, that's that's another that's another layer. Yes, I think that is a whole other conversation about collecting. Who's collecting? Who's making the choices? Uh, uh, is it informed by the personality, by the time, by, of course, budgetary restrictions? And uh, so there is a whole other conversation. And I think uh, uh, we touched on this when we had last year uh, Walter Camus here, because he was the mm -hmm. beginning, uh, or a collector at the beginning, who uh, started the permanent collection here. Mm -hmm. um, I still want to meet him. We got to do it. Yes, I think <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yeah. He's waiting. Uh, the way you hung some things are sometimes, uh, sometimes there are stylistic connections, sometimes there are uh, ways of seeing works talking to each other. There's mm -hmm. this conversation going on that is not, it's a dialogue not only with you and, and your work and this of permanent collection, but the pieces themselves talk to each other too. Yeah. And I see this all through uh, the uh, the exhibitions uh, like these two pieces talk to each other because they are so uh, closely connected in terms of color and the use of you know the color and the atmospheric uh, connection and, and attitudes of the young women definitely <laughs> yes but I would like to kind of like think about or talk to you a little bit about this room here that is mostly about the absence of a body mm -hmm. and the implication of the body. Uh, that is not there. Yes. In a different way, that is not there over there with an easel where just uh, you have a, you have this uh, 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 a different take on this. Here you see shells, you know, clothing, cover-ups, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And I would like you to talk a little bit about uh, your fascination with covering up the body. Uh, in many different ways, but let's just start by talking about the burqa. The burqa. Um, I don't know if you've seen, had a chance to see this painting. It was a very recent one done in the last few months of a, of a, a, a woman in a burqa. And it's, um, the burqa is an interesting um, uh, piece of clothing to me because there's so many associations with it in our culture as well as in Muslim culture. And there's, there's a whole range of uh, emotional reactions to it from the very negative, it's imprisonment, it's, uh, re it's confining women to um, people who wear the burqa for religious reasons feel that it uh, gives them the freedom to go about without being um, molested or you know, bothered by, you know, they save their, themselves for their husband at home. Um, so I've done a lot of reading about it. I've looked at a lot of, of images, and it's very interesting to to um, to read the range in you know of opinions in in uh, writings by Muslim women as well as uh, women in 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 this culture. And so I found this burqa at a vintage shop in Pittsfield, and I bought it, and I was had it in my studio for a long time. And I was a little scared of it, and I tried it on once, and I was, you know, woo. And then, um, but I really wanted to paint it. So a model that I had painted and sculpted and drawn, Jerica, um, many times, uh, was very interesting, um, bright young woman, and she um, modeled it for me 
one day for three hours, and all, all the time we were talking about what's it like to be in there, you know, how do you experience this? And she, you know, it felt a little stifling, you know, um, but also felt sensuous inside because it's a very sensuous material. And I, I was interested in painting it from an aesthetic point of view. How do I make this painting a, a big blue piece of cloth? You know, how do I try to make it look interesting? And then how do I get a feeling of a person in there? Because I think um, that one of the problems is that we see the burqa and we don't see the person in there. We don't understand why that person is in there. So that's what I was trying to get, get to. Is that too much information? <laughs> no. No, it's totally interesting. And uh, I think there is, I, I have also uh, read something about burqas because I was at one point very interested in Islamic art. Yeah. And, and the whole idea of the burqa and uh, how people are perceiving that is, is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's a fascinating reading list. If anybody's mm -hmm. interested, I have a couple of books too. You lent me one and I'm, I'm ready for more. Okay, so. good. <laughs> um, so here is a burqa of concealing the body. And then there, is, uh, then there, there are some ways of dealing with clothing. And I think that's a, such an interesting, and always throughout our time memorial, uh, painters have been interested, or sculptors have been interested in if, if the, the body that is naked, the body is not quite naked. And it's, like, it's always, let's face it, it's a huge preoccupation. Uh, of human beings to see the body in various days of undress. Uh, and, you know, striptease is the most common uh, uh, way of uh, illustrating that. So we have also, like, dress as a, um, as a concealment, but it's also an accoutrement. It is an adornment, and uh, it is sometimes used in religious contexts, like the burqa at one point, but also this gym dine. Uh, drawing that is a um, an interesting piece because it reminds me a little bit of kimonos. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole other tradition that is using uh, clothes cover-ups as a, a, a in a whole other context. Mm -hmm. um, so there is this uh, this interesting way of ho how we all are using cl clothes. It's this is how we oftentimes. Uh, use ourselves to identify. It's like one point of hair is a big deal. How you have your hair is a major way of uh, creating our own identity or underlying it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is clothes. Right. And besides self expression, um, I've always been interested in clothing. I can't help it. You know, I'm just sort of, I'm letting it seep into my artwork now. Um, uh, it's a self-expression, it's an artistic self-expression, but also as, a, um, as an artistic device. Anybody who's painted or sculpted knows, you know, it gives you line and gesture, it gives you color, it gives you dark and light, you know, you can, you can really use it to create, to create a, um, an image. Um, so that red dress is my favorite red party dress, and I, it's not a dressy event, or I would have worn it tonight. <laughs> but um, so anyway, um, I've painted it. I've done a pastel of it. I've done a woodblock print of it, and some. And then um, after I had chosen all the pieces here and written the artist statement, and was really ready, you know, to to say it's done, I had the urge to create one more piece, and uh, and that's how that that specter. Um, the lit from within white muslin piece evolved. Um, I saw um, um, that there had been an exhibit here in the 80s of a woman sculptor named Judith Shea. And I saw an image, some of her imagery, and I thought, oh, that's so wonderful. She was, she's interested in fashion and sculpture, and she made the fashion into very sophisticated sculpture. Um, and so I thought, I've had this idea of a little of a waxed dress for a while. I used to do batik, so uh, to work with the muslin, um, the same dress that that red dress is, the same pattern, and you know, work out how to wax it, how to light it, how to hang it. But I wanted it to be spectral. I wanted it to be ghost-like. I wanted it to just appear in the corner of the gallery. So anyway, that was the icing on the cake to do one more piece and have it 
um, have it turn out the way it turned out. So Betsy told me that, uh, because it's all of a sudden here's a piece of sculpture in there, I was completely surprised. Uh, and then she's telling me that she's been interested in sculpture and has taken classes, and this has been a, um, an impulse to actually create something that is three-dimensional. Right. And, uh, and that may actually get you into a completely other way. I want to try it in clay now. <laughs> See if I can do it in clay. Yes. So um, there's going to be more coming. Yes, there will be. And then maybe some more with wax, because I don't think I'm finished with that. OK, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. So um, I think that we uh, are kind of, kind of would like to open this up to any questions or comments from the audience. If anybody has to uh, want to say something, ask a question to either Betsy or myself, please uh, feel free. David. <laughs> um, you speak about the four seasons of life here, mm -hmm. and they're clearly delineated and represented here. Uh, and I remember running into you shortly after you, uh, you were doing this exhibition. You had no idea what you were going to do. And I'm right. curious about a couple of things. How, and I, I know you went into the collection, you talked about that, uh, your relationship to the collection and allowing the work to to influence you. Um, so two things, can you talk about um, that space in between not knowing and knowing? Mm -hmm. your, your first real formal understanding or for, formal structure, even if it evolved, but what right. got you from here to, from A to B, maybe you're at Z now, but uh -huh. A to B. And then also I'm curious about um, this room here where you, because you sort of pr press it into the embodied and the disembodied in this room represents mm -hmm. the disembodied. Can you talk a little bit about the spiritual, the, your relationship to the idea of the body being gone and the, the memory of the body in the space of the dress, mm -hmm. and especially the red one? Sure. Let me just rephrase a little bit for the sake of the videotaping. Uh, so well, there are two parts of the question. Uh, what, how do you describe the, uh, the process of uh, uh, not being quite sure what you are going to show and, uh, and what brings you to that next step of like, making conscious decisions, planned decisions of some sort? That's one question. The next question is about this room. Uh, to my left, um, what is the spiritual component to the disembodied aspect of these pieces that have to do with clothes, mm -hmm. the absence of a body in there? Mm -hmm. Well, David, I think it was, it was primarily visual, the, the, the transition from not knowing and being overwhelmed to, uh, to developing an idea was looking at those 3,000 images online and realizing that I was op as open-minded as I was trying to be, I went right back to the thing that always draws me, which is the human body. And I said, okay, that's what you really love, do it. You know. So it was, it was using my eyes and trusting my instincts. And then going through those, those images and choosing, you know, choosing what really spoke to me and also, I have a couple of alternate shows in there, you know? There was a show of all scary things that I thought, there's a lot of scary stuff in this collection for some reason. Or, you know. Oh, you're so easily scared. Is. Oh, yeah, my own. <laughs> it's the abstract, ex abstract expressionist period, where, you know, it's sort of like, well, anyway, like that. Um, I represented it here. Anyway, so that, I hope that answers that question. It was visual and then trusting my instinct, what I'm drawn to. Um, as far as the embodied, disembodied element, I think that that is a stage of life thing. I did this corpse flower self-portrait when I turned 60 as a memento mori. I was thinking, wow, you know, 60, I probably passed two thirds of my life. I have another 30 years maybe, you know, what, you know, what is that? You know, so it's a very thoughtful kind of introspective experience in the late spring to be painting that around my 60th birthday. And I think that led me to looking at my other work. Um, the red dress, you know, it has a sense of, of presence to it be beyond the cloth, I think. 
Um, it's floating in the air. It's, it casts a shadow, you know? It's almost like it's a there's a spiritual thing, and it's a portrait, yeah. So, um, so I guess I'm seeing that, and then there's the whole aging thing going on there in that far room. So, I don't know. Did I answer your question? Well, yes, but I think just to follow on that, what's, these two pieces are, are very abstract conceptual pieces. There's no body, so you, in, in a way, you've left figuration, you've left the, the reality, and you've gone into memory, into the idea of you know, something that existed that doesn't exist any longer. Mm -hmm. um, and then the red and the white are also kind of telling uh, of something. I haven't even thought of that, but I think I'll give it some thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's as if this is a ghost of that dress. And I don't know why I'm so fixated on that dress, but I am. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yeah, I just didn't know this. You go for it. Oh, oh right. yeah. <laughs> There's somebody there, too. Okay. But, yeah. So the question is, in this kind of a process, have you become a different, uh, an artist that has been changed by the experience? I think this is uh, Larry kind of asked this short snippet of a question. Very good question, because I have. And I don't know if everyone has experienced that, but I definitely have in, on several levels. Um, one level is being empowered to choose and express myself in my choices and to write about it and to arrange it. Um, it's very empowering, especially for an artist who works, you know, mostly alone. You know, a lot of us work alone in our studios, but it was a very empowering experience. So um, it was very valid, it was validating to find that my work could fit into this, con this more contemporary, modern, modern to contemporary collection in, in an, in certain interesting ways. Um, and it had me, I mean, I'm surprised. This is my favorite piece, this unraveling body. Um, to, that's my favorite piece. I love that piece. There's something about the, I, I imagine that just came right off the charcoal of the, of the artist. And um, I don't know that I would have picked that piece before, but you know, I really appreciate that piece. And, I, and um, something about seeing things in a, in a different context ex was expansive for me. Yeah. This is a piece by Paul Darrow, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find much about him. No. <laughs> He's a mystery. Yeah. It's a California artist, that's all I know. <laughs> Right. Um, what it means for you, like what, it, what does that mean for you as a non-Muslim woman to create that piece? Um, and it, it is maybe my work, my, my job as a spectator to figure that out, but I'm just wondering, I can't help but ask you what, what, what it feels for you to do that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the question was, uh, uh, painting a burqa as a non-Muslim woman um, has its own complication. Uh, because of this, uh, the, the connotations that are being uh, 
uh, applied to by Westerners uh, towards the burqa as a negative image. And uh, what does it mean for uh, Betsy to to paint this? And what is what what are the um, your feelings about that? And right, and also um, uh, by Muslim um, culture. Right. It, uh, um, yeah, that's, that's, that is the question that scares me the most <laughs> because I've been thinking about this a lot. You know, I think I didn't approach the burqa for a long time because uh, I had some respect for it. I had, you know, a lot of, uh, I didn't understand it. Um, so I did some studying about it. I looked at, at images both from, you know, non-Muslim and Muslim sources. Um, I read a book that Ava lent me, which was written in the 60s about um, uh, an American anthropologist who went and lived in a small village in Iraq and lived with the, with the local women in, their, in the burqa and in the women's quarters, and she really absorbed. So I sort of saw, you know, but I, I know, I acknowledge this is cultural appropriation. I acknowledge that, you know. But it's something that I'm interested in. I'm interested in clothing, I'm interested in cultures, I'm interested in the veil. And I wanna explore the idea of the veil in both a physical sense, the wearing of the veil from a drawing I did of Mary, mother of Jesus, wearing a veil, to uh, I, I did a portrait of an Indonesian young woman wearing her jilbab, and we talked about it for the whole you know, long hours that I was painting her and what it meant to her. Um, she wouldn't let me paint her jeans because if her pa family saw her w wearing the jilbab with jeans, she wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be good. Um, and I want to explore this further. I mean, there are lots of uh, references to wearing, covering, cloaking ourselves, you know, throughout history in costume and cultures. And, and to me, it also, um, I hope this, happens, but I, I would like to, to explore the idea of veiling, unveiling, um, opacity, and um, transparency. We have such a tr an emphasis on transparency in our culture, and I think that it shouldn't be at the expense of opacity. And um, I think there's, a, there's something that I can do in this whole arena. Did I satisfy your question? Yes. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, in this, uh, has no more questions. I want to thank you everyone for coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of this evening with a glass of wine and some more cheese if you want to. And uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>